Under a full moon, the New York Mets' 1989 season unfolded like a mystery novel. At times, this looked like the best team in baseball. High in the air to right field, it's deep. Back goes O'Neill to the track near the wall, and it's out of here! 2-1 homer, Howard Johnson. The pitch by Dwight Gooden. Lane drive hit hard to left center. McReynolds on the run, reaching out. Oh, great catch! He's going to try for three. The ball gets away from Daniels. Scott is going to try and score. Here's the relay by Lark, and he scores! Line drive, center field, Dykstra coming, makes the catch, and the game is over. Well hit drive, deep to right field. Back goes Bernanski, over his head, off the top of the wall. Jeffries had his first second. Get up! Two run dog, I'll take it. That's what we're talking about. On the surface, the storyline was filled with great plays by athletes in arms, which were second to none. One, two pitch, swing and a miss, he got him with a fastball. There he goes, the pitch, swing and a miss, struck him out. Three, two pitch, in there for a call strike three. Got him. In 1989, nearly three million fans came to Shea Stadium to see the next heroic chapter. But just as often as not, they found a distressing subplot. Billy Randolph, who's 0 for 4. And he hits a fly ball deep to right field. Strawberry on the track. Gone! A home run! And the Dodgers take the lead. Games seemingly won were lost, often under the most bizarre of circumstances. I don't believe what we just saw. An opposite field home run by Willie Randolph. His first home run of the year, and it's an opposite field shot. The division title, which at times seemed ready to settle gently into their grasp, would slip just out of reach. At times, the Mets could soar as high as they had during their championship year in the mid-80s then be laid as low as the lean years at the beginning of the decade. Since 1984, the Mets had averaged over 95 wins a year. So when all chances at a spot in the playoffs vanished over the horizon with a week left to go in the season, they were left with an empty feeling. The high standard of the 80s had not been realized with a second place finish. You know, it drives you crazy. It's, it's mind-boggling to think of how many opportunities we had and, and that we blew. And uh, it's tough to swallow. It's something we're going to have to live with all winter. Well, we've had a lot of ups and downs. It seems like we put together too many streaks of uh, losses and wins. We seem like we'd win five in a row and lose four in a row. And that's just the way the season went. I think the one lesson everybody learned in here is you can't turn it on and off. You have to be able to go hard all the time for the best results. And I think that was the biggest lesson learned this past year. It's been a tough year, but uh, then again, some good things came out of this year, so this one of us should make team, you know, the players out hungry and come to spring training ready to play. We're disappointed we didn't win, but let's look at the glass being half full and let's look forward to next year. And this is a year of transition for the New York Mets, and um, the way the front office and everybody looking at it and throughout the organization is that uh, uh, at this point we're looking towards next year, and uh, a lot of positive things came about from this year, and we learned a lot about uh, different players and we've learned a lot about our, our weaknesses and strengths so uh, if you look back at this season and we have a, a whole off season to reflect upon it um, you know there's going to be the proper moves being made this upcoming year so 1990 is an exciting year for the Mets. Yes I think we've gone through a lot of transition this year uh, and most of it we anticipated would come a year from now but it's come a year early and I think a lot of it's behind us and we have every reason to look forward to an exciting 1990 and 1990s generally. I expect to be one of the foremost powers uh, in baseball with the New York Mets. I think we have every reason to believe and every reason to hope that we will be a, as dominant a team in the 90s as we were uh, in the five-year period that ran through 84 through 89. The decade of the 80s began on a negative note. 
as the number seven IRT pulled into a desolate and nearly forgotten baseball outpost. At Shea, the Mets were struggling, and worse, few were on hand to notice. They were frozen between the memories of the past and the magic yet to come. An occasional Dave Kong Kingman blast proved to be the only life still stirring at the ballpark. Seven years had passed since the Mets' last pennant, and even those with the deepest of faith sometimes found it hard to watch. were just not very good and everyone knew it. We are going to turn this ball club around. I can't tell you how long it's going to take to win a pennant. I think we're going to win a pennant. If I didn't really feel that way, I wouldn't have taken the job in the first place. Frank Cashin was brought in to change all that. Cashin cleaned house and gathered new faces, including Davey Johnson, who would become the winningest manager in Mets history. Swung on, that's the ball game! Into deep left field, that ball is gone! A grand slam home run! And the New York Mets win it 8 to 4. Hamlin's coming around to score. Flannery to second to throw. Out at home! He's out at home! To throw to third! Out at third! The Mets win it 6 to 5. What a double play! Here's Strawberry on the drive. Way back. Empire was on the rise in the Empire State, and after a few rebuilding years, the number seven IRT was jammed again. Power at the plate was matched by heat from the hill as New York assembled an imposing arsenal of pitchers. Good fastball blows Sandberg right out of it. Oh, that rising fastball got him. Got him with the split finger fastball. And again, Ojeda took something off. By the mid-1980s, Davy Johnson's Mets were packing in fans and punching out opponents. <laughs> tradition of excellence had begun that before the end of the decade would lead to four second place finishes, two division titles, and in 1986, a trip to the World Series. The heart-stopping league championship series against the Houston Astros foreshadowed the Mets' date with destiny. And a high fly ball In the 1986 World Series, these new Mets were both good and lucky as heroes emerged in the clutch to defeat the Boston Red Sox in seven games. Now the wind-up in the delivery. 
brief slug on, hit in the air, fairly deep to left field, going back near the wall, looking out, goodbye! A run, Ray Nate! And then clean, four to three! He's bring him out! Bring him out! The best has won in the World Series! The New York Mets were world champions for 1986. And another playoff appearance in 1988 helped to underscore and define the decade. Before, the Mets had hoped to win. Now, they were expected to. The final year of the decade began on a cold day at Shea with Dwight Gooden preparing to continue a Mets tradition. 17 times in the previous 19 seasons, New York had won its opener. And Howard Johnson quickly warmed up the chilly April afternoon by starting a personal hot streak that would last clear into September. Hojo came out of the box swinging and so did his running mate, Daryl Strawberry. The Mets ran away with their 18th opening day win since 1970, and Johnson provided the appropriate 400-foot punctuation. New York beat St. Louis 8-4 behind their ace, and for the first month, it looked like a typical Doc Gooden season was underway. But as the weather warmed, early warning signs appeared. Doc was winning, but he wasn't under complete control. Pitch way outside, goes over Lions Glove. Here comes Martinez, he'll score, and it is now a five to three ball game. And that one just got away from Dwight Gooden. That is his seventh wild pitch of the year. The way that pitch got away, it looked as though Dwight didn't have a real good feel or a real good grip on it because it just slid right out of his hand all the way back to the backstop. That wasn't even close. By midsummer, despite a nine and four record, Everyone suspected that something was wrong with Doc's arm, and opposing hitters were proving it. Against the Reds, Gooden was forced to leave in the third inning, making it the shortest outing of his career. A slight muscle tear in his right shoulder was diagnosed as Doc went on the DL and started nearly a season of speculation. Stiffness in his right shoulder and should be back after the All-Star break. Good with the All-Star break should miss only... Weeks of waiting stretched into months of worry until finally on September 13th in Philadelphia, a familiar form resurfaced in an unfamiliar place. Doc Gooden came out of the bullpen against the Phillies for the most crucial test of his young career. Even Philly fans were pulling for him to succeed. Walking into the mound, I thought that I was made, and you hear the crowd, you know, was cheering and everything, which I thought was great. It was pretty touching. And once in a month, then you just like, uh, you got there, you forget what, you know, what am I here to do? And then what made it even funny, a couple guys in the uh, Phillies dugout stood up and cheered and, and you know, clapped, and I thought that was great. For the millions of you who have been patiently seated in the waiting room, the doctor is in. Good and ready to work. Now the one-two pitch, swing and a miss. He got him with a fastball. He blew one by Ricky Jordan. That's the hardest pitch Doc has thrown so far. Boy, that was vintage Doc Heat also, that high cheese. After three innings of scoreless relief, Met fans could start breathing again. Put a tag on this inning that Doc is good and ready. A week later in Chicago, Gooden came on in relief one more time before the season ended. And now Davy Johnson is on his way to the mound. He has Randy Myers warmed up, and he may take Doc out of the game. I don't know. He's asking Doc how he's feeling. He's going to leave him in there. Gooden played the stopper as he got the last out and his first save after 100 wins as a starter. Even without a full-time Gooden, the Mets led the league in strikeouts and fewest hits allowed behind Randy Myers out of the bullpen. Starters Ron Darling, David Cohn, Bob Ojeda, and especially Sid Fernandez, a big man who also swung a mean bat. He has got two hits. Here's a drive right field. That ball's way back. How about that? Home run, Sid Fernandez. He's got 
had three hits and he's allowed two. What a night. Sid Fernandez night at Bush Stadium. That was crushed. But Sid was most comfortable crushing the will of opposing hitters, which he did with an arsenal of power pitches that led to 198 strikeouts for the season. On July 14th against Atlanta, he sent the entire Brave lineup back to the dugout, shaking their heads. Fernandez totaled 16 strikeouts for the night, including Lonnie Smith his first three times up, but unfortunately not his fourth. Lonnie Smith high and deep to left field. Negretto's back. The ball game is over. And the Braves win it 3-2, and the 16 strikeouts go for naught. Despite the disappointment, Sid kept his cool and set a personal best with 14 wins for the season. The Mets youth movement was headed up by calm Kevin Elster and hyper Greg Jeffries. While these two had dissimilar personalities, they formed a double play combination on the rise. And in the beginning of the year, it was held together by Kevin Elster's record-setting performance at shortstop. Ground ball toward the hole, backhanded by Elster, the hurry throw, he got him! Oh! Wow, what a play. Pitch on the way, line drive to short, caught by Elster, side retire. The 0-2 pitch, hit on the ground, past the mound, toward the middle, Elster gets to it, throws on the run, and he got him. Great play, Kevin Elster going far to his left to end the inning. Rain or shine, Elster was flawless. Kevin Elster has played in his 73rd consecutive game without an error, and that is a new Major League record. The middle, Elster can do it all. And Jeffries... In the beginning, Greg Jeffries couldn't seem to do anything right. However, I'm not too sure he had control of the ball. And a balk call on Roger McDowell. Bouncing ball on the right side of the infield. Safe at first base. Now, wait a minute. They'll have the option here. That's right. Greg Jeffries made a very bad play. Terrible play. Early in his first full big league season... Jeffries was pressing in the field and tied in knots at the plate. I was hitting, I think, about 180 the first half, you know, with no home runs, and it was just, uh, it was a miserable, miserable first half for me. I was just hoping to get over 200, you know, and that, I was thinking, God, hitting 180, it's not going to look real good on my baseball card, you know, so I've uh, been real intense type player, and that's where I need to play, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to just lay back and just kind of go through it. I got to, you know, really get into it, get dirty, and that's the way I play, and I've always played like that. Greg Jeffries kept getting dirty, and his game started to fall into place both in the field and at bat. Deep to right. Back goes Bernanski. Gone. A home run. Jeffries started late, but he went on to lead all National League rookies in both home runs and RBIs. After the All-Star break, Jeffries caught fire. And while typically Kevin Elster kept his cool, he got pretty hot with the bat himself. Get in the air to left field. It's deep. Back goes Reigns to the track. Back to the wall. It's out of here. Elster has now hit in 16 of his last 17 games. The All-Star break arrived. Kevin Elster was hitting 202. And he is hitting just around 400 since then. Changed hitter since the All-Star break. Finally, the double play combination clicked into place as Jeffries borrowed some of Elster's control and Kevin picked up a bit of Greg's intensity. Two, they kept things interesting right down to the final out of the final home game of the season. The game is over and a fight breaks out. 
Jeffries and McDowell are in a fight. Jeffries tackles Roger McDowell, drives him to the ground at the mound. Both teams pour out of the dugout. This had to be something personal between Jeffries and Roger McDowell. It's a bizarre ending in the final home game of the year to what has certainly been a bizarre season for the New York Mets. And I guess when you think about it, although it's unfortunate, it's only fitting. The final home game ended in fisticuffs, but earlier in that same game, the mood had been warm and nostalgic. Two of the greatest Mets of all time were preparing to make their final curtain call. I put the picture in the, in the five hole. Who is it? Uh, Whitehurst. Yeah, he's going to lead off. He's out of the game. Carter's going to lead off. Gary Carter and Keith Hernandez were saying goodbye. And Keith Hernandez will be a presenter. Getting a standing ovation from the crowd that senses that this may be the last time they get to see Keith Hernandez. Can it possibly be that it's been over six years since Keith Hernandez arrived in New York? In June of 1983, the media and fans alike trumpeted the arrival of Keith Hernandez as the heart of the Mets' plan for building a champion. They hoped his gold glove would solidify the defense. They also hoped his proven bat would fill a hole in the middle of the order. But after Keith stepped in, they knew they had the man who would show the young New York Mets how to win. And it's through the middle! Second, bottom of eight. Base hit center field. Hernandez comes through again. We got a five ball. Keith's remarkable ability to deliver in the clutch was an extension of his overall mastery of the science of hitting and a passion for batting with the game on the line. Hernandez at bat never seemed complete until a Met base runner crossed the plate as Keith became the rarest of hitters. The bat control specialist and the big RBI man rolled into one. But the sweet swing that was tailored to guide the ball to an open space could also be cut loose to go deep. His skill with the bat was memorable, but Keith's dexterity with the glove was unforgettable. Cruz with a ground ball. It's a fair ball, and Hernandez has got it. Woo! The throw is in time. What a play. Look at Hernandez. A golden glove. First baseman makes a golden glove play. As a Met, Keith continued a string that resulted in 11 straight gold gloves an all-time major league record for first baseman. Keith's unmatched knowledge of his position kept him a step ahead of the opposition and enabled him to make plays that other first basemen wouldn't have dreamed of trying. In one game, circumstances forced Gary Carter from catcher to third base, so the field general took over. Those plays, there's a runner on first and second, I don't have to hold a runner on. And that particular play, it was a pitcher that was just called up. He's probably nervous to death. I just more or less took it for granted. Well, I didn't take it for granted. I knew that he was going to bunt. There was no doubt in my mind that he was going to do anything to bunt. He did, and I went right there on top of the play. He didn't get down the third base line enough. To get it by me, they had to hit it hard down the third base line, and I take that away, and it's an easy two. With his intensity and talent, Keith commanded the entire diamond from his own little corner of the world. Whether by a subtle gesture of encouragement or a well-timed word of advice, Mex made his presence felt nine innings a game, 162 games a year. And in recognition of his unique value, 
The Mets named Hernandez the first captain in team history. Keith's immeasurable importance to the team was not lost on the fans, who in turn inspired Hernandez to drive himself beyond the limits of his own ability. The greatest leaders lead by example. And it was Keith's play that showed the Mets what winning was all about. In 1985's September showdown with St. Louis, Keith proved to his teammates that the Mets could be champions. Base hit left field. Here comes Wilson. Coleman can come up with a Mets win. Seven to six. The Mets are in first place by a game. 85 turned out to be a dress rehearsal for 86, when in the decisive playoff game with Houston, Keith's critical hit helped lift the Mets to the World Series. And a fly ball, well hit the right center, Billy Hatcher on the run, on the run, way back, can't get it, base hit, over his head, Wilson around third, Lukey will score. The Mets' run of good fortune appeared to have finally run out in the seventh game of the World Series. The Mets were being shut out late in the game until Keith stepped up with the bases loaded. And a line drive, base hit, going in the gap in left center, but Billy will score. Bounding third is Mookie. Mookie will score. Three to two. Three to two. A team-wide explosion followed, and the world championship it produced tasted especially sweet to the man who supported his teammates on their long climb to the top. Keith was the backbone of the Mets championship, then the nerve center was Gary Carter. In Montreal, he was a seven-time all-star performer, and the first time he teamed with Dwight Gooden, Gary Carter called the signals that struck out the side in the 1984 all-star game. The next season, Carter was a Met, and New York had the game's premier catcher. From behind home plate, he orchestrated the New York Mets' rise to the top. to block the plate and the arm to gun down base runners, Gary Carter had all the tools and the leadership ability to join Keith Hernandez as co-captain of the Mets. Class. Confidence. Courage. Competitiveness. But what really set Gary apart from other catchers in baseball was what happened when he got out from behind the plate and stepped up to it. In his very first game as a New York Met, Gary Carter came through in the clutch. In the 1985 home opener against the St. Louis Cardinals, Carter immediately endeared himself to the New York fans with a game-winning home run in extra innings. One of the memorable milestones of Carter's career came on August 11th, 1988. High fly ball hit deep to left field. This may be it. It may go. Home run. 300 for Gary Carter. Only three catchers in baseball history have hit more home runs than Gary Carter. But perhaps his finest moments as a Met were singles that he hit during the 1986 playoffs. 
In the 12th inning of Game 5 with Houston, the Astros intentionally walked Keith Hernandez, bringing Carter to the plate. Although he was only 1 for 21 in the playoffs at that point, Gary was not about to let his teammates down. In Game 6 of the World Series, the Mets were in a similar situation. Boston should have known better than to pitch to Gary Carter. Fans on their feet here at Shea. Bases loaded, one down. Red Sox lead three to two. Swung on, hit in the air to left field. It'll be caught, runner tag. Here comes Mazzilli. Here comes the throw to the plate. Not in time. The game is tied at 3-3. In the top of the 10th, Boston rallied to regain the lead. Deep to left field, way back, way back, boy. Gone, a home run. The Red Sox are in front. Four to three. Everybody's sitting very quietly in that New York Mets dugout. Hoping against hope that something will start to happen. Carter then started the unforgettable rally that saved the Mets from elimination. The Mets were world champions, and Gary Carter had the honor he had always dreamed of and a ring that went with it. I've saved this uh, right ring finger for that World Series ring. From the youthful enthusiasm that earned him his nickname, The Kid, to his effervescent smile, Gary Carter played the game the way it was meant to be played. So it was that in the last home game of the 1989 season, Coach Bud Harrelson arranged a final curtain call for Mex and the kid. Now this uh, this kid out there, uh, does he want to catch the last inning? Okay, tell him he's in there. Well, I'll get him out on deck so they can look at him anyway. Kids, kids leading off. Just let the stage get set, and then you go out there. You are listening to a cheering crowd, cheering for Gary Carter, as they cheered at the last inning for Keith Hernandez. He is having a very tough time fighting back the tears as he listens to this ovation. Hey, Lucy Goosey, come on now! Got a drive well hit down the left field line, hit it toward the corner, fair ball! Extra base hit Gary Carter. Carter goes to second with a two-base hit. Gary Carter ripped it. Hard line drive. Buried it in the corner. Dops his helmet now to the crowd here at Jay. On September 27th, 1989, two players that New York fans will never forget left the team in the same manner they had embraced it, with dignity and class. The torch of leadership had been passed. A new generation of Mets must pick it up. Players like Elster and Jeffries, Dave Magadan, Barry Lyons, and Mackie Sasser. Inspiration will also have to come from veteran-run producers Kevin McReynolds and Daryl Strawberry. This outfield power station combined for 162 RBIs and 51 home runs in 1989. Field. Back is Shelby. Back to the track. Out of here. Home run. A grand slam homer for Kevin McReynolds and the Mets lead it. Although some folks gripe about their laid-back approach, Kevin and Darrell have the talent to make great plays look almost routine. Goes Strawberry, he's back to the track, back near the wall, he jumps, and he makes the catch! Harris tags at second, goes to third, turns there, throw back to third by Jeffries, they got him hung up, and the tag made by Hocho, the inning's over. Double play. A 
Another outfielder who showed promise was young Mark Carrion. His spectacular catches came in pairs, with two for the year that were nearly identical. Carrion also tied a Mets record for pinch hit home runs. Corner, it's out of here! For Mark Carrion, his fourth pinch hit home run of the year, and that ties a Mets club record. While new faces came into focus, some old familiar ones faded away as the Mets made several daring trades. The main trades with Samuel and Viola, uh, you're talking about players in their 20s, their late 20s. Uh, they weren't trades just made for the all or nothing of it. They were made with the eye to the future as well as the present. The club was sagging, really needed a boost, and we felt that uh, bringing in a player like a Juan Samuel, who had uh, such good years with the Philadelphia Phillies, uh, had such good physical skills, would really help the Mets ball club. We kind of jumpstart the offense a little bit, which we have, we're hoping for and looking for the whole year. Samuel wins it with a base hit to right. And there's no equivocating on this one. This is the biggest win of the year, at least so far. The Frank Viola trade was, here's a 29-year-old pitcher who was a Cy Young Award winner just the year before, won 25 games. And we felt that uh, with the injury to Dwight Gooden and its unexpected length, we didn't expect him to be out as long as he had been, uh, we could bring in a pitcher like a Frank Viola and he could take up that slack and, and fill that void. The one thing I had going for me was I was a Mets fan growing up and I was going back home. So, you know, that was a thrilling part, but I expect a lot out of myself. You know, I'm, I'm probably my worst critic, and this year was a period, bad year. And uh, uh, hopefully after six good years, I get one bad year out of the way, I'm able to put together six more good seasons. A one nothing shutout for Frank Viola. The blend of bringing in a couple of players from the outside and the development of your own young players, and then the improvement of a player like a Howard Johnson all should blend together to make for a good future. Early in the spring, Howard Johnson was all bundled up in trade rumors, and his arm hurt. For a while, every ground ball hit in Hojo's direction turned into an adventure. Johnson, eight errors in spring training, seven on throws. And by the looks of things, you can't really say that Howard Johnson's arm is healthy. Hojo's arm may not have been healthy at the start, but it was healing fast. Ground ball to third, tough chance. Johnson has it, the throw a quick one, and the good one. Oh, Johnson gets his first chance tonight, and he handles it as far as the throwing part. Perfect. Hey, and he's giving him a big, big cheer. Look at him. Look his hat off. All right. <laughs> There's more discussion about his last of his arm than Venus the model. His arm problems ended and Hojo was off and running to the kind of season that every player dreams about. Johnson did it all, in the field, at the plate, and on the bases as he ran those trade rumors into the ground, then made the all-star team for the first time. During the wild ride of 89, Hojo hit in seven different spots and slammed a home run in each one. Along the way, he set four new Mets records, had six personal bests for a season, and tied another with 36 home runs. Hojo had everybody thinking long ball. Howard Johnson's hot streak lasted all season as impressive numbers kept piling up. 
And he has just set another New York Mets club record. That is his 77th extra base hit of the season. The runner goes. The pitch is a strike. Throw to second, not nearly in time. And Howard Johnson has his 30th stolen base of the year. This one hit deep to right center. It could be home run number 29. And it is. Howard Johnson is still the only 2020 man in Major League Baseball. from becoming a 30-30 man. This ball hit deep to right field, way back. Marshall to the warning track. It is gone. Goodbye. And Howard Johnson joins the 30-30 club for the second time. Hard ball deep to center field. This ball is going to be out of the ballpark. Howard Johnson, three-run home run. 101 RBIs. In 1989, the New York Mets didn't win a title. But behind Howard Johnson, they set the stage for the 1990s. I try not to delude myself. I think that's the worst thing you can do. So when I say to you that I feel the Mets are going to be a real force in baseball in 1990 and beyond, I say that to you with great conviction. And I think what we're going to see is some real enthusiasm next spring to prove that 1989 was uh, an anachronism. It didn't really fit with the recent history of the Mets, and that the team that we're going to put on the field in 1990 is more like the team we had on the field in 84, and 85, and 86, and 87, and 88.